Hello and welcome to this Sunday service at Sheldon Road Church here in Chippenham. It's lovely to have you with us, whether you're old or young or somewhere in between, whether you've been a Christian for many years or you're not yet a Christian or somewhere in between. We hope you enjoy our time together, discovering more about God and his love for each one of us. My name's Trevor Ranger, and some of you will know that as part of my work, I would normally be going into 15 schools each month, leading assemblies, conducting assemblies. Now, obviously, over this last year, that hasn't been possible. But I have still been doing assemblies. I've been pre-recording them and sending them out to schools, or else I've been doing live Zoom assemblies, where I sit in my office, and on my computer screen, I see lots of groups of children in their classes, or individual children in their homes. It's been quite a challenge. But one thing that we have looked at this year is this question. What is God like? What is God like? And for some people, when they think about God, they think of him sort of sitting on a cloud in the sky and with a big bushy beard and stopping us having fun and being a bit of an ogre. And I don't think that's what God is like at all. Other people think that he's more like a fairy godmother who's there to give us our every wish and to take away all of our problems. And again, I don't think that's what God is like. But how do we find out what God is like? Well, a little bit later we'll be thinking about that in more detail. All I will say for the moment is that all the assemblies we've done this year can be summarised in three words. What we've learnt is that God is great. Amazing, come 
Let us pray. Let us pray for our world. We pray for world leaders and decision makers, that they will be guided to make the right choices for the benefit of all. We lift before you areas of conflict and war, famine, and those suffering extremes of weather. We thank you for Christians throughout the world. Give them extra strength as they seek to serve you. We pray for our own country. We pray for our royal family and our government. We thank you for the example set by our Queen as she serves you and her people. Guide our government as they seek to manage the economic and social recovery of our nation. May they make decisions that are just and fair. We thank you for all key workers, often working under extreme pressure and fatigue. Be their strength. We thank you for the scientists working on all vaccines and for the success of the COVID vaccination programme in this country. We pray for a sharing of vaccines with poorer countries worldwide, that they may be able to share in this success. We place into your loving care all who have suffered due to COVID, through job loss, financial insecurity, health, illness, bereavement, and in many other ways. And for people suffering from anxieties and worries for the future, give them your peace. We pray for our own community. You may wish to focus on your own area. We will be focusing on Chippenham and the community around Sheldon Road. We thank you for our church building and that we are able to open our doors once more to make a start in helping meet the needs of our local community. Guide us in the way we should go. We thank you for our local councillors who give their time and energy to serve the area and for all our community leaders. We thank you for our teachers and all who work in education. May they enjoy rest over the school holidays. We pray for our church, Sheldon Road in Chippenham. We thank you for our minister, Andrew, and his family, and look forward to getting to know them face to face soon. Bless them all as they enjoy family time over the summer holidays. Be with our church leaders as they guide us through the next few months. Help us all to be open to your voice and not to be frightened to step out and try new ideas. We thank you for those in our congregation, in person and online. We remember before you those known to each of us who are suffering ill health or bereavement. Hold them in your loving arms and give them peace. We pray for ourselves. Each one of us knows the prayers of our hearts, our pleases, our thank yous, our concerns and worries. Worries that we have, things on our mind, our praises for you. Lord, in your mercy, hear all our prayers, spoken and unspoken. Amen. Now, all through history, there have been some people who have been described as great a great footballer or a great singer or a great painter or, or a great sculptor all sorts of people described as great but some people and it's usually kings or queens 
are described as being great as part of their title, as part of their name. They're given the name great. So, for example, um, 300 years before Jesus was born, uh, there was a man called Alexander. He was the king of uh, a place called Macedon in Greece, and he was known as Alexander the Great. So what we're going to do now, we're going to play a game of great or not so great. And I'm going to give you the names of four kings and queens, and you've got to work out whether they were called great or whether they were given the name that was not so great. So it's great or not so great. Okay, here we start off with a, a, I think is a nice, easy one. He was called Alfred. He was king of the Saxons. But was he Alfred the Great or Alfred the something else? Not so great. Have a think about it for a moment. Those of you that live in or around Chippenham should have a better understanding of this. Let's see what you think. Okay, I can tell you now that he was called Alfred the Great. Yes, very uh, well known around here because uh, he uh, used to stay around in Chippenham. He had a hunting lodge here. Okay, next one. Uh, the king or the Tsar of Bulgaria was a man called Ivalo. Ivalo was the Tsar of Bulgaria. Was he Ivalo the Great or was he Ivalo the something not so great? Have a think about it. Make up your mind. Who thinks he was great? Okay. Who thinks he was something not so great? All right. Well, let me tell you, Ivalo was known as Ivalo the Lettuce. Yeah, Ivalo the Lettuce. Can you believe anyone gets called a lettuce? But yes, that was his name. Not so great, I don't think. There we go. Next one. Number three, Catherine, who was the queen or the empress of Russia many, many years ago. Was she Catherine the Great? Or Catherine, Catherine the not so great. What do you think? Who thinks great? Hands up. Yeah, okay. Who thinks that she had a name that was not so great? Okay, all right, very good. Okay, well, I can tell you that she was called Catherine the Great, and she was the Empress of Russia. Okay, next one. Louis V the king of France. Louis V, the king of France. Was he Louis V, who was Louis the Great, or was he Louis the something else, not so great? Who thinks he was Louis the Great? Okay. What about Louis the not so great? Okay. Well, I can tell you he was called Louis the do-nothing. Louis the do-nothing. And the reason for that was that he only uh, was king for about a year. So he didn't have a chance to do anything, really. Didn't win any battles, didn't make, make any changes in his country. So he was Louis the do-nothing. I'm going to do one more. I wasn't going to do this one, but we will do this one. What about Charles II, the King of France? Charles II, King of France. Was he Charles the Great or Charles the something not so great? Have a think. Make up your mind. Who thinks it's great? OK. Who thinks it was not so great? All right. Well, I can tell you, Charles II was known as Charles the Bald, the Bald, which means he didn't have any hair, except if you look in the pictures, he did have hair. And anyway, people who are bald can be great, can't they? So uh, that doesn't really count. Anyway, there we go. That's the end of the quiz. But I wonder what makes a person great or not so great? So what makes a person great? Well, often in the Bible, when God is described as being great, he's described as being great in terms of the world that he created. The stars, the planets, the mountains, the rivers, the trees, the flowers, the birds, the animals. All of these things, the Bible says, make God great. And who am I to argue? After all, I don't know of anybody else who's created an entire universe except God. That, for me, makes him great. Now, this summer, during the holidays, we were supposed to be running a holiday club at our church called The Wonder Zone, which would have been looking at the world in which we live and thinking, isn't it amazing? Isn't God great? Sadly, we haven't been able to uh, run it this summer, but we hope to run that programme next February half term. So if you know of any children who would like to come along, do mark that date in your diary. That's the time we're hoping to run the programme.
As part of the program, we were going to show these next two items. In a few moments' time, we're going to be speaking to a young lady called Claire Weathers, who is an astronomer and who many of us will know because she was brought up here in Chippenham and she used to worship at our church at Sheldon Road. But before we listen to Claire and before I interview her, let's hear from Francesca about one particular psalm in the Bible which speaks of God's greatness. More than 3,000 years ago, there lived a man called David. He was no ordinary man. He was a king. He was king of God's people called the Israelites. David loved God and wanted to live his way. Sometimes he got it right, sometimes he got it wrong. But he knew that he could talk to God about whatever happened. Sometimes he had to say sorry to God. Sometimes he needed to ask God to help him. And sometimes he just had to shout about the amazing things God had done. If you look in the Bible, you can find a book called The Psalms. This is where you can discover all the things that David talked to God about. One of the songs David wrote to God was all about the stars, the planets, the sun and the moon. And it goes something like this. Oh God, you are in charge of everything. Your name is amazing and the whole earth knows it. When I look into the night sky, I can see how wonderful you are. I know it, children know it, even toddlers and tiny babies know it. They all sing to you about your great and marvellous deeds. The praises of children cause your enemies to fall silent. Everyone who has turned against you can think of nothing else to say. I think about everything in the sky, the whole breadth of the heavens that you have made. I think about the moon and the stars, the sun and the planets. You put all of these things in their own special place. I ask myself, why do you care about us humans? We are tiny, we are weak, we don't live very long compared to you. And yet we are only second to you. You have given us crowns of glory and honour. You have put us in charge of everything you have made. You put it all <laughs> under our power. The sheep, the cow, every wild animal, the birds in the sky, the fish in the sea, and all the creatures of the ocean. Oh God, you are in charge of everything. Your name is amazing and the whole earth knows it. And that's it. One of David's special songs to God. So Claire, Thank you ever so much for uh, meeting us this, today. Now, you are mm -hmm. an astronomer, is that right? Yes. Yeah, okay. Right. <laughs> you want to remind us uh, what astronomy is? Um, so basically, astronomy is just looking at the stars and the, the planets and the galaxies, just everything in space that you can see and figuring out why it's there and what it's doing. Very good. And you do this for your job, is that right? Uh, yes. Yeah, that, that's my day job. <laughs> And you, your research and your job is to research and to find out more about the world in which we live. Uh, yes, so we image, we, we actually use telescopes all around the world to look at different parts of our universe um, and kind of answer questions about how we got here, um, how everything kind of came to be. Um, so that's what I do day to day. Yeah. Excellent. Now, most of us will know a little bit about planet Earth and uh, being, it being part of the solar system. But what do we mean by the solar system? Um, so our solar system is the sun and all the planets that move around the sun and all the moons that move around the planet. Um, but our sun is only one of 100 billion stars in our galaxy, which we call the Milky Way. So each one of those stars has its own solar system with potentially planets just like Earth. Now, we haven't yet found life on any other planet in our solar system. Um, so what's so special about Earth that we have so much life here? So Earth actually exists in a very special position in our solar system. And as astronomers, we call this the Goldilocks zone because it's just the right distance from the sun, that it's not too hot and it's not too cold, and it's just the right temperature for life to grow. Um, but also Earth itself is really special in that it has a breathable atmosphere, so oxygen that we can breathe, and water. And when we look for signs of life in other planets in the universe, uh, one of the first things we look for are signs of a, a breathable atmosphere and water on those planets as well. So that's really important. So Earth is a bit special as far as our solar system is concerned. 
as far as our solar system is concerned, Earth is very special, yeah. Now you've studied something called supermassive black holes. What mm -hmm. on Earth are they, or what not on Earth <laughs> are they? <laughs> um, that's a good question. Um, so your kind of run-of-the-mill black hole is usually a dead star. So when you have a very, very big star, much, much larger than our sun, and it comes to the end of its lifetime, all the stuff that was once a star will collapse into a very, very small ball, essentially. Uh, and that's what we call the black hole. And the reason that it's black is because um, its gravity is so strong that even light can't escape. So if you think about the Earth, that also has gravity in that uh, it stops us when we're walking around, it stops us from floating off into space, it pulls us down. And a black hole has exactly the same, but it's very, very, very strong. And so instead of stopping people from falling into space, it's stopping light from escaping. Um, but supermassive black holes are uh, just these on a very, very extreme scale. And these only exist in the center of galaxies. So these are really huge versions of these black holes. Very good. And how far away is the nearest supermassive black hole to Earth? So the nearest supermassive black hole is in the middle of our galaxy, the Milky Way. Okay. Um, but there are lots of smaller black holes that are closer to Earth. Um, so the closest one, I think, is around a thousand light years away. Oh, um, so if you on, imagine... Hold on, hold on, hold on. I thought you were going to say a thousand <laughs> miles away. What, what a light Oh, gives. no, no, no. Much, much further. <laughs> so if you imagine a torch, if you shine a torch, um, if you could travel as fast as that, as that beam of light that's coming out of the torch, it would take you a thousand years to get to the nearest black hole. My goodness. Long way away. Long, long, long way away. <laughs> so we shouldn't be worried about them then? Oh, absolutely not. They're nothing to worry about. Okay. <laughs> Now at the Wonder Zone this week, we're thinking a lot about God's amazing world. And after all these years of studying the universe, it, I wonder, do you ever still go, wow, that's amazing? Or does it just seem so ordinary to you now? Uh, I think that there are still moments where I, I think, wow. Um, in particular, if I'm looking at the night sky, especially even on a clear night where you can see hundreds and thousands of stars in the sky, um, that's still only a tiny fraction of what's actually there. So to me, it's amazing that when we take these big telescopes that we use in, in my work and we point it at a seemingly blank patch of sky, in that tiny patch, there's billions of galaxies, each with their own uh, sets of stars, each with their own sets of planets. So just the sheer scale of the universe is something that still makes me say, wow. Um, yeah, Claire, or shall I say Dr. Claire, <laughs> <laughs> thank you ever so much for talking to us today. It's been brilliant. Absolutely no even, worries. Even I understood what you were saying. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Take thank care. You for God bless. Me. Bye. Bye. Thank you.
Have a look at these four paintings and see what you think. Maybe like me, you recognise one of those paintings and it seems very familiar. The, the one on the bottom right, I know that is supposed to be Ludwig van Beethoven, the classical composer who lived some 250 years ago. Yeah, we know that's Beethoven, we see that picture all the time. But what about the other three paintings? <laughs> well, if I tell you that the other three paintings are also supposed to be of Beethoven, you might be a bit surprised because to me they don't look anything alike. Even allowing for the fact that Beethoven would have changed appearance as he got older, they still don't seem like four pictures of the same person. So I think one of two things has been going on here. Either the painters of these pictures have been really, really bad, and I don't think that's the case because they're quite good paintings, they're just not very accurate, or else They've painted Beethoven from memory. Perhaps they've met him once or seen him uh, conducting one of his pieces in a concert and they've looked at him and they've tried to remember what he looked like and they've gone home back to their studio and painted what they think and what they remember him looking like. I think that's more likely, that Beethoven wasn't actually there when they painted these pictures, otherwise they would surely look a bit more alike. And yet we still know quite a bit about Beethoven, not so much about what he looked like, because we have no photographs, no film, but we know a lot about him from his music, um, either by listening to it or by people who are clever enough to perform his pieces. Uh, we know something about him because of what he wrote in his diary. We know some of the letters that he wrote and some of the letters that he received. And many of the people that knew him best, his friends and family, also wrote down what they noticed about Beethoven. So we get quite a good picture of what Beethoven was like as a character, what his nature was like, what his temperament was like. That's how we know what Beethoven was like. But how can we know what God is like? Well, I'm going to suggest there are three ways of getting to know God. You can probably think of others, but these are the three that I can think of. The first way is to read our Bibles and to use them as a guide. And in the same way that a person painting a picture looks up at their subject, then looks down at their canvas, looks up at their subject and down at their canvas, making sure they've got the nose right, making sure they've got the eyes right, making sure they've got their hair right, they keep looking at the person to make sure they've got the drawing right or the painting right. That's what we need to do with the Bible. We need to make sure that our understanding of God is right by looking at the Bible. We need to make sure our understanding of God's world is right by looking at the Bible. If we leave the Bible out of the equation, then we're just guessing and trying to remember what God is like. And that doesn't always work. No, 
This Bible is what helps us get to know what God is really like. The Old Testament tells us all about the amazing things that God did through and with his people, the people of God, and for the world in general. And then in the New Testament, the Apostle Paul talks about Jesus being the nature, the very nature of God in human form. That if we want to know what God is like, we just need to look at Jesus. So when Jesus shows compassion to someone, that's because God has compassion for people. When Jesus shows love to someone, that's because God loves people. When Jesus wants justice to be done, that's because God is a God of justice. And when Jesus does amazing miracles, that's because God is a God of miracles, a powerful God. When we want to know what God is like, we need to turn to our Bibles and we need especially to look closely at the life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus. Because when we look at Jesus, we're looking at what God is like. So that's one way we can get to know God, by reading our Bibles. Another way of getting to know God is to get to know him through prayer. Not just by reading our Bible, but by talking to him and by listening to him, spending time with him. After all, it's one thing to know about somebody, it's another thing to actually get to know them and to have a relationship with them. Uh, some of us will have had really wonderful relationships with friends and family over the years, but we wouldn't have had those wonderful friendships and wonderful relationships had we not got to know those people first. To get to know what God is really like, we need to talk to him and to listen to him, be ready to hear what he has to say. And finally, to really get to know God very, very well, we don't just need to read our Bibles, we don't just need to talk to him and to listen to him, we also need to respond to him, to respond to what you've discovered about God. If you've discovered that God is a loving God, well, you need to respond to that. If you've discovered that God wants you to be his child, a child of God, well, you need to respond to that. You need to say yes or no, but you need to respond. You need to say, Father God, thank you for your love for me. Lord Jesus, thank you for dying for me. Thank you that you came back to life so that I could be friends with you today. We need to say these things and we need to respond to the love and to the kindness and the compassion that we see in God and we see in Jesus. And who knows, there might come a time when you can say about God, yes, God is my God. And yes, Jesus is my Jesus and my Saviour.
We're coming to the end of our time together today and I hope you've enjoyed it and I hope you found it helpful. It's certainly been good to have you with us. Thank you. Thank you too for everyone who's been involved in producing this service behind the scenes or in front of the camera. We're very grateful to you. But if you're sitting there or standing there and you're thinking, I don't just want to know about God or about Jesus, I want to get to know God personally, and you're not quite sure how to do it, then please do get in touch with us. We'd love to be able to help you in any way we can. Our contact details can be found at the end of this service. And it may be that you want to know what it means to be forgiven or you, know, you want to know what it feels like to, to sense the love and the joy and the peace that only God can bring. Or maybe you want to know what it means to be a child of God and to know God as your loving Heavenly Father, or to know Jesus as your brother and as your friend and as your saviour. Do get in touch if we can help you in any way. Right now though, let's just pray. Father God, thank you that you make it possible for us to get to know about you as we read the Bible. Thank you that you also make it possible for us to get to know you personally. Thank you for the life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus, who shows us what, it, what God is like, what you are like. Help us to think about how we want to respond to what we know about you and the love you have demonstrated for each one of us. Be with us this week, we pray. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all now and evermore. Amen. Thank you for your company and we're really pleased you joined us today. For those of you on YouTube, then we'd like it if you could subscribe to our channel. There's no cost, but you'll get notifications of the latest video if you also click the bell symbol. You can also click the thumbs up button if you enjoyed the video.